Cruz and Lacan, I think. Okay. So I have, like, questions and stuff. Like, I wrote... I have things written. I don't know if you did that. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I'm unprepared as hell. Just because, like, I want to get your views on certain differences in the theories because mm -hmm. you say that you're more Lacanian than Deleuzian and I'm like the inverse of that mm -hmm. <laughs> so I okay. wanted to wait what <laughs> I just want to make a disclaimer that like I'm really not that knowledgeable on Lacan yet right but, that's like, fine I feel like these thinkers are really hard to get into yeah, they're, like, notoriously impenetrable, people say. Mm -hmm. And people spend, like, decades trying to... <laughs> That's true. ...delineate the concepts, but... I wanted to ask you about desire, because... Desire. It's different in Lacan and Deleuze and Guattari. Mm-hmm. Because Lacan says that... Well, his his concept of desire is... That desire is a lack, but yeah. Deleuze and Guattari um, complicate that more and have a productive conception of desire as well as a productive conception of the unconscious. And they they basically, um, in Anti-Oedipus, they also delineate the fact that the, that lack that Lacanians talk about is also produced by desire like for Deleuze and Guattari desire is the first and foremost mm -hmm. so yeah, I, well, where are you at with that um I was reading like an article the other day well not an article but some text somewhere and like uh, it was a pretty interesting notion that like desire can like um get fixed in a sort of repetition or a loop like in Lacanian terms, but only if, like, it's repressed. So, like, basically, when it becomes, like, um, I guess, less productive and goes into repetition. But, like, yeah, Lacan's um, desire is based on a lack, and it always, like, repeats, or it doesn't repeat, but it's never like full it's never satisfied right it's the lack Which, that is never yeah. fulfilled whereas i think like guattari and deleuze they i don't think they speak of a lack or anything right well, it's just like they don't like the idea that desire is simply a lack they think that mm -hmm. that lack is Produced by desire as well, and produced by anti-production. And this goes into, like, I think there's a really radical um, concept that emerges out of this analysis. Because basically, what they put forward is that, because um, you talk about repression, and mm -hmm. Deleuze and Guattari don't like how um, psychoanalysis in their times, and what I would say is, like, Psych psychology today even um, ignores, mm -hmm. especially like Freudian variety, it ignores how um, social repression crosses into and amplifies and creates psychological repression. Yeah. So for this Deleuze Guattari and like materialist psychiatry, it ha I think this is like a really radical and liberative concept because it basically says that um, maybe even this lack that the Lacanians talk about is something that is produced in all of us by anti-production um, perpetuated by the socius that is capital under capitalism. You're, you're actually making a point here because um, I think Lacan says that l desire and lack and like, basically the entire unconscious is like structured by the symbolic order or by even like capitalism law rules stuff like that and like there you can um, what, what i'm trying to say desire is always contingent on you know the like the social norms and stuff and capitalism and social issues right 
Yeah. And I think the Luz actually said that Lacan took the first step in um schizophrening Freud, I think. Yeah, yeah. There so that's what I really like about Lacan, it's that like it's a lot less essentialist than Freud what he did. Exactly, yeah. And I would also probably say a lot less essentialist than Hegel. I'm not that familiar with Hegel, but like tell me more. Well, simply because like the um what is the term for it? The objective like Hegel's version oh, of the, Yeah, 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 the uh the objective spirit or something. <laughs> yeah, and how Lacan would rather conceive of it as something that is more like societally contingent. Yeah, yeah. But I wrote something um, mm -hmm. a few months ago about this kind of subject, and it's kind of like, it, it's I was, I was like ramming into this Deleuzian concept without really knowing that that's what I was doing, but mm -hmm. um, I basically wrote that we're all lacking something that we never had, which would be Lacan's real. But why did we never have it in the first place is the question that comes to my mind when I um, get into the, these Lacanian concepts. Oh, um. And I think it could be connected to like the Marxist conception of alienation as well. It must be societally contingent because I don't believe that there's a human condition that isn't conditional. And so I think we all sort of lack control of our lives because of societal institutions, corporate and governmental. And we feel this lack of control, we supplement it with things like religion and sexual activity and drug use and things like this. But this lack of control functions on a societal level beyond our individual control, even though we may and often do experience it as well as our supplementation of it on an individual level. And the supplementation of our alienation or lack also functions on a societal level as well. Yeah. Well, like society basically gives us like a code of like how to act, how to be like, and you know, people like, even if they don't realize it, I think like they, they feel stuck in a way. They feel like they're not free. Right. Actually, Lacan on alienation, he actually says that. Are you familiar with um the mirror stage? Uh, a little bit. I've I watched the plastic pills video about that. Yeah, <laughs> it should be enough. Basically, just like when like um the toddler sees himself in the image and like recognize recognizes himself, right? Yeah. Now that's um the point where the ego in like Freudian terms is you know comes into creation. And he uh, Lacan says that that um the mirror stage is actually a misrecognition and that it's actually a source of alienation because it objectifies ourselves and like it reifies ourselves an image of ourselves which isn't the same thing as being ourselves in a way yeah and then we're sort of like constantly trying to be seen in order to validate yeah. the fact that we exist yeah and on top of that that image is also um very much um how should i say this like it originates a lot from like social norms and how our parents or like surroundings want us to be in a way so like it's not it's basically an alienating other that we have but that we identify with basically mm. it's pretty complicated i think a common connecting theme between all these concepts that we're sort of just like blasting out there yeah is that um, what's in our minds is influenced, if not determined, by what's in the world around us. Definitely, yeah. 
I think that's a crucial point that Marx was right on, that um, material conditions, like, shape us way more than we shape the opposite. Right. But we're we're trained constantly in this society, like, ideologically, to think in the opposite way of, like, it's all just your individual agency, and... Yeah, I know. <laughs> things are the way they are because of people and ideas instead of, like, actual mm -hmm. conditions. Or one thing, like, that we're always told how, like, well, when I was growing up in school and stuff, we were always told about, like, how our countries were, like, free and, like, democratic and blah, 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 but, like... <laughs> Growing up, I realized that it's all pretty much bullshit. We're like forced to just work our entire lives <laughs> for someone that doesn't give a shit about us. Yeah, but like we're we're very much conditioned into thinking that we're free. Totally, it's a condition of unfreedom that is presented yeah. to us as freedom, and we're supposed to exactly. accept it as freedom pretty sad it's it is a tragedy and um there's something particular to the american conception of capitalism as freedom as well i think mm -hmm. but, yeah but they basically equate like market freedom i guess with like freedom in the absolute it's weird yeah it's it's like the freedom to exploit and be exploited is the freedom that we are supposed to be so grateful for having. Oh. Uh, like, uh, one thing, I just want to mention this, but, like, I just find the, like, right-winger, like, market-oriented worldview so, like, boring, unimaginative. <laughs> yeah. I agree. <laughs> It's basically just, like, an absorption of, like, the status quo. And, like, there's nothing beyond that. <laughs> and, like, right-wing intellectual content sucks. It's so... It's not even interesting. Like, <laughs> Like, all the cool ideas are, like, from the leftist dudes. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's pretty crazy also, like, a lot of philosophers, especially, like, last century, were, like, leftists, or, like, there's barely any right-wing philosophers, from what I can tell. There's a lot of, like, right-wing appropriations of philosophy, yeah. though. Like, Nietzsche, everyone thinks is, like, yeah. oh, the fascist, <laughs> but no. right-wing, yeah. They just, like, misquote him to make him look like a fascist. Right, and and this, I think, connects to um, a sort of Deleuzian concept of, like, deterritorializing and, like, body without organs type thing as well, because there is also, like, a there is a revolutionary potential in those things, but there's also a fascistic potential in those things. And you see that in how um, fascist ideologies will appropriate mythologies and, like, claim this whole mythological history. They claim the domain of world history as their, like, birthright, basically. It's, it's, it's kind of schizoanalytic, the way that that happens. Yeah, yeah, like, blood and soil and stuff like that. Yeah, and we, we have to, like, return to this, this history that never existed. Never, <laughs> never existed in the first place. Fascism is weird. Fascism is weird. Like, yeah. It's, it's such an incoherent ideology, literally. Like, well, I think uh, there was this thinker, I don't remember who, who said, like, fascists, like, like, they only say what, you know, will get them to power, basically. Like, they, they have a bunch of rhetoric about, like, even, um, like, mythology and stuff, but they don't believe in any of that. They don't give a crap. Right. Like, like Hitler would, would speak of, like, the Aryan race and whatever. This guy was, like, drugging himself, <laughs> like, 
you know, he was the degenerate he was talking about, like, fully impersonated. Yeah, that's, there's an interesting thing about that as well with, like, the fascist femboys that you see on, like, (laughs) the internet and stuff. The fascist, like, the Nazi furries I've seen, like, what? It's, yeah, it's very strange. 